Good evening, everybody, or good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone. Uh, and welcome to another historical materialism broadcast brought to you in cooperation with Haymarket, which uh, generously offer us the use of their YouTube channel. My name is Panagiotis Sotiris. I'm an editorial board member of Historical Materialism Journal. And tonight we're having a discussion on uh, Massimiliano Tomba's insurgent universality and alternative legacy of modernity. In the latest issue of the journal, the last issue of 2022, uh, we had uh, uh, a symposium on uh, Tomba's book, which included uh, interventions by Tomba himself, by Aldo Beretta and Rebecca Friedzel, by Vanita Seth, by Harry Harutunian, and Nicholas Fletcher. And tonight we are having uh, with us uh, Massimiliano Tomba, who is now a professor of history, of course, at, a professor at the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, we have uh, Doberetta, who is a research fellow at the Center for Humanities and Social Change of Humboldt Universität in Berlin. And we also have uh, Alberto Toscano, also a member of the editorial board of, of historical materialism, a professor at Goldsmiths University in London, and uh, a visiting professor in Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Uh, the format of, the, of tonight's uh, discussion is we will start with uh, an introduction by, by, by Massimiliano, then Aldo and Alberto are going to uh, intervene. We are going to get questions from the audience so that we have second round of comments and discussions. I will be, I will act as uh, chair, but I might also uh, say a couple of things. I, I had the honor of writing the introduction for the for the symposium in, in historical materialism. Those of us who are watching us, uh, please, if you want to post any questions, use the chat function at the YouTube. Uh, we're going to take the questions from there and relay them to our uh, speakers. And uh, as usual, I will end this introduction with an urgent plea to support historical materialism by subscribing to the journal, uh, by donating whatever you have. If you, uh, if you came here through Eventbrite, you know we ask for uh, any kind of donation by buying the books either through your institution, through, through Brill, or a year later when they appear in really affordable prices through K-Market. And without further ado, I pass the floor to Massimiliano Tomba. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for inviting me and for having this uh, conversation. So uh, I think I am supposed to say a few things about my my last book, Insurgent Universality. Uh, let me start uh, with the, the reason why I, I wrote the book. So when I started writing Insurgent Universality, I had a few questions in mind. I think common questions, many of us have a similar questions. So one is uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, the idea or even the, the myth of uh, of uh, of history, the sense uh, that history has a final goal. This idea, final goal, this idea, this uh, teleological understanding of history, has uh, has collapsed. Uh, I think it's difficult to find uh, people around who really believe that uh, history has a final destination today. And then the question is uh, uh, how it's possible to rethink uh, politics and history uh, without uh, teleology. So this is uh, basically the, one of the main idea in, in, in the books. So when I, I, I start, uh, started writing uh, the, diff the, the four historical chapters, uh, the idea was uh, basically to uh, dig in these uh, historical events uh, without 
a, a, a unilinear histor a unilinear historical perception. The idea was to find different trajectories, uh, different uh, 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 historical trajectories, and competing alternatives. So the the other the other big question I had in mind, uh, also related to our present, uh, is uh, that uh, at least in part of the of the world, uh, big institutional structures like uh, mass parties, mass socialist parties, uh, radical unions, uh, all these uh, big institutions uh, have uh, collapsed, as they say, at least in a part of the world. And, uh, and the point is again, so how can we think politics, uh, what the politics looks like without these uh, gigantic institutions. A third question I had in mind uh, is about, uh, let me put it in this way, the, the, the possible parts of constraints, so, uh, so the, the, the positive part of our political discourse. So mm -hmm. what I mean is uh, that uh, we know a lot about uh, the crisis of uh, capitalism, the crisis of, uh, of democracy and the state, uh, but uh, rarely we know or we have an idea of uh, with what we want to replace these things. How is possible to think in positive terms, real alternatives, and not only thinking about that, but uh, you know, to point out experiments, events in which this alternative emerged. What I mean is that basically, and this is another assumption of the book, uh, I think uh, that uh, <clears throat> many of uh, our categories or the categories and concepts that uh, we use to think uh, about political transformation, a lot of uh, these uh, categories and concepts are, are exhausted, are no longer able to imagine a, a different present or a different future. Uh, at the same time, I don't think we can generate categories from scratch. Uh, the only alternative I was able to see was a uh, and this is how I organized my work, is how it's possible to extract new categories and concepts, or maybe even a kind of a normativity from historical events. So not from theories, but from historical events. So the idea is that uh, in, uh, in, in the events that I consider in the book, and they are the, you know, one specific moment of the French Revolution, the 1793, the Paris Commune, 18, 1871, the beginning of the Russian Revolution, 1918. I choose 1918 because it's the year of the first constitution when they brought and, 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 and when they brought the first constitution. And then the Last chapter is uh, 1994, another date that is for the Zapatistas insurgency. So the, the idea is uh, to consider these uh, insurgents as, uh, as a theorist, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the activists whose practice is a theory in action. And then what the, uh, I try to do is uh, to extract the categories from their practice that I consider as a theory. I read their declarations and manifestos as I usually read Hegel, Kant, and Plato as a, as a, as a, as a theoretic, as theoretical text. And I paid the same attention to what they brought in their declarations. So, the, 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 the point is very simple in a certain way. If it's true, let's assume that it, it is true 
that our concepts and categories are exhausted, then what uh, I've done is uh, to consider these uh, practices from a theoretical point of view as a step ahead. So as a, as a, as a, as a theory that is ahead than the practice, that, than, than the categories which are available to us. So in a certain way, is the theory that, is, that has to try to catch up with this uh, embodied theory in practices and not the other way around. It's no longer theory that can dictate practice, uh, it's no longer theory that can dictate practices what to do and what is the next step. Uh, another thing uh, that is uh, crucial in my, in my book is, uh, and I say that already, that uh, when I, I consider these historical ch chapters, these uh, four historical events, and basically I'm doing something similar in my new project, but with the more recent events. Uh, what I do is, uh, is, uh, is a kind of uh, art of uh, digging into the past in order to find and reanimate interrupted alternative trajectories. And uh, obviously in doing that, I am very influenced by people like Walter Benjamin and Ernst Bloch. So the idea is that uh, there is, a, there, is the, there is a future, or if you want the plural, futures encapsulated in the past. There are many trajectories which have been interrupted, crashed, violently crashed. For example, this is part of my new project, you know, the, the 15, 25 German peasants war in which an alternative, an alternative modernity was possible and was experimented by these peasants and Thomas Mills was, uh, was uh, brutally, violently crushed. The peasants were massacred by what has become the dominant modernity. So Luther and the princes and the modern state on the other side. So the, the idea is, uh, is, uh, is a try to, uh, it's not to write, this is important, I, I don't write, I never write an history of uh, victims and defeats. For me, it's the other way around, is a, is a how to write these uh, histories of uh, what Benjamin would have called the, the struggling, the, the oppressed struggling classes. I want to reanimate those struggles as a kind of a task for us in the present to reanimate and to accomplish today what has been interrupted in the past. This is the Benjaminian gesture in the book. At the same time, these other trajectories show us in action in the, in, in the, in the concreteness of, of, of the experiment Different, different categories, uh, different forms of a possession, different forms of a self-government, uh, and, uh, and, and forms of a communities which are not conservative or reactionaries, but they are different forms of uh, being together. So they showed us a form of uh, uh, political togetherness that is not organized around uh, people uh, or, or sovereignty as a nation sovereignty, as a unity, as the unity of the state. Indeed, all these experiments are organized around a kind of a pluralism, legal pluralism and pluralism of the powers in which the state can still exist. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a war against the state, but the state becomes a kind of a unit among the many units. And the state is limited not by a, system, a check and balance system, but is limited by the, the coexistence of uh, many other powers and authorities. Obviously, what you get is a, is a, is a political configuration that is, uh, that is kind of a more unstable and can be even risky. 
because uh, conflicts can emerge all the time. Uh, and sometimes people object that uh, my, my alternative is, uh, is too unstable and too risky. Uh, I would say, usually my answer is, uh, yes, but politics has to do with the risk. Politics has to do with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, kind of, uh, how to deal with the instability. Uh, otherwise, if we, if we want a stable political configuration, I think uh, the dominant modern political theory has uh, many models uh, for this kind of stability. So we can go back to Thomas Hobbes and then, and then we can try to understand the state as a mechanism that uh, neutralizes conflict. So this is basically the trajectory that goes from Hobbes to Carl Schmitt. But I think we need something, something else. And this, uh, this is something else uh, is, uh, is uh, another thing that uh, I try to emphasize in the book. And this is uh, maybe my last point is, uh, is, the, is the democratic excess that uh, always emerge in these uh, events. Uh, what is the democratic excess? This is not a term that I invented. This is actually a term that uh, Robespierre used against the radical sanculots. And uh, when the radical sanculots in the French during the French Revolution in 1792-93, when they claimed their, they actually, they didn't claim, they practiced their, their right to convoke their assemblies whenever they wanted and to recall representatives, this is what uh, is called imperative mandate, and to question the decision of the convention. So when all these uh, assemblies in their actual practice question the, 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 the sovereignty of the convention, Robespierre say that uh, this uh, democratic excess can destroy the nation and can destroy the state. Now, the point is that Robespierre was right, but for the wrong reason. Uh, it was right because it's true that the democratic excess can destroy the state, but the state that the, that the democratic excess destroys is the state that is based on national sovereignty, unity, and the representation of the people, nation people, as a, as a totality. This is the kind of a state that the Robespierre was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, this is the, yeah, this is, this is the, this is the kind of state that the French Revolution was realizing, was, uh, was uh, putting in place. But as I say, there were, there were alternatives, there were other trajectories, which the French terror as a, as a crushed and repressed. In a certain way, the French terror is, uh, or was, the way through which the dominant trajectory of the modern state was established. And uh, <clears throat> so what, uh, what I try to do in, 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 in this book is uh, to, to trace the kind of uh, history of this uh, democratic excess and basically to restore the dignity of this excess as, as something that uh, breaks the continuity of uh, what I call the dominant trajectory of modernity, state, capitalism, private property. So breaks this continuity and gives space and provides some space for the alternatives to, to the state and, uh, and the capitalist uh, pro uh, form of production. So this is basically the, 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 the big theoretical framework uh, in, in the book. And as I say, <clears throat> The theory in the book is basically uh, uh, condensed in the, in the first chapter. And then there are four historical chapters in which 
I, I, I do exactly what I just said. I try to extract theory from concrete events, concrete cases. That's it. Thanks a lot, Max. And I pass the floor to Aldo. Thank you very much, uh, Massimiliano. Thank you very much. And um, yes, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I would like to divide my, my commentary to uh, Massimiliano Tomba's book in four brief sections. Um, section one has to do basically with some theoretical resources present in insurgent universality. Section two uh, takes or is based in my critical observations to what I believe to be the fundamental uh, concepts or notions of uh, Massimiliano Tomba's book, namely temporalities, universality, and insurgency. Section three um, takes into account Massimiliano, uh, Massimiliano Tomba's response to the article that Rebecca Fritzl and myself wrote recently within the symposium. And uh, section four is more or less a final note in this uh, initial dialogue based on uh, Massimiliano Tomba's book. So, um, the first section some theoretical motives in insurgent universality. In my view, the fundamental theoretical resources employed by Massimiliano Tomba to supersede the dominant conception of time are mainly based on Koselek, Bloch, Marx, and Benjamin. This is quite clear, quite transparent in the book itself, and as Massimiliano just stated, these are, I believe to be the, the concepts or the, the reference points through which also Massimiliano conducts this kind of dialectic between theory and practice, theory and historical practice. So, uh, on the first place, uh, Koselek's notion of historical times. I believe that this concept plays a decisive role. But for Koselek, human individuals and human communities have a space of experience where the past is present and enables action. Associated with this space of experience, individuals and communities act with reference to specific horizons of expectations. Historical time, then, is the relation between specific experiences and expectations, namely the internal dynamism of a specific life world where experience, the past, and expectations, the future, are coordinated in a particular form. Second, uh, Tomba also has recourse to the notion of multiverse introduced by Ernst Bloch. Also, I would claim a fundamental pillar for understanding uh, Massimiliano Tomba's book. The book. Um, especially Bloch in his fourth thesis on the concept of progress, for whom the underlying historical unilinearity presupposed in the concept, concept of progress had to be challenged by the voices of history joined I quote, in perpetual and often intricate counterpoint. I, I believe that uh, this, this um, to be also very important. The critique of the unidirectional development of history, as Massimiliano Tomba just mentioned, associated with progress, was put into question by a multidirectional articulation of diverse historical experiences and expectations. Um, on the, the third aspect or the third um, motive, uh, inspiration probably, um, 
I would be tempted to say that this is the, the basic inspiration, but I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's based on Karl Marx, and especially on um, Karl Marx's response to uh, Vera Sasulic, or at least the attempts or the, the drafts that uh, Karl Marx wrote as an attempt to answer those letters uh, that he received from Vera Sasulic. Uh, in this case, uh, Tomba recuperates the notion of contemporaneity as a co-presence between the capitalist mode of production and different overlapping forms of existence. The topic of the forms of existence, Dasein's Formen, uh, is already present in the Grundrisse, but I think that in the drafts um, written as a potential response to Vera Sasulic, uh, Marx shows a different kind of overlapping between the mo capitalist mode of production and the diversity or the plurality of um, forms of being. For example, the Russian commune conceived as a non-homogeneous historical process. And I think this is also an important inspiration for Massimiliano Tomba. Fourth and last, Tomba also draws upon, this is, I, I believe that this is uh, the decisive element, draws upon two elements from uh, Walter Benjamin, especially thesis 16 and thesis 17 of his, uh, on the concept of history. Um, these two elements would be a, the critique of the notion of the continuous course of history and b, the reconstruction of the suppressed past. These, uh, this articulation or these two elements put together um, make sense by articulating the critique on the representation that historicism withholds regarding the past as a closed reality, inaccessible to reflexive intervention, towards which the historical materialist creates an experience with the past to blast open the continuum of history. Such a reflexive intervention, I claim, this is what Massimiliano Tomba attempts with his book, a ref reflexive intervention, enables an interruption of the linearity of history because the historical materialist recognizes a revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed past that discovers the unrealized possibilities that have not yet become history. What um, actually Massimiliano Tomba just referred to as futures, capsules of futures interrupted in the past. As Tomba indicates following Benjamin in his book, it is about working with the roads not taken or repressed, which from the past can shed light on the possibilities that were left unfinished, but remain vital to reimagine our present. So though, those would be the, some theoretical resources that I uh, believe to be central uh, for understanding or creating some kind of dialogue with uh, Massimiliano Tomba's uh, book and uh, theoretical endeavor. Second section, my critical observations. Um, so my first critical observation to Thomas argument relates to the, I, I, I wrote about this, um, the indistinctive terminology at play of temporalities as a formal concept and historical temporalities as their multiple concrete real, realizations. Uh, I believe that if this distinction remains unclear, the term temporalities, although pluralized, could entail a relapse towards a Kantian model where history is um, configured in time 
instead of what could be called a post Hegelian motive, where history is the configuration of time uh, correlated by social practice. Pluralizing and culturally situating the concept of uh, temporalities does not necessarily indicate that human practice constitutes social space and time. On the contrary, it could mistakenly point the predominance of time over history. My second critical remark would be that even when the uh, synchronistic force of a dominant temporality is counteracted by a recognition of the plurality temporalities, the notion of time as the real more social practice takes place should be questioned if the coexistence of unrelated particular stories aims to achieve some kind of unity. Giving up the challenge of historical correlation by implicitly granting predominance to the coexistence of plural temporality could make the conceptual resources articulated by Tomba shift to a relativist interaction between different constellations of experience and expectations without any mediation or without any apparent mediation that links them together. Uh, my third remark would be that in order to avoid this relativistic shortcoming, where the only alternative would be an overlapping mosaic of particularities, it would be necessary to maintain both premises of the Zapatista resolution together, namely one world where many worlds fit. This is precisely because not only the consequences of the universal, the abstract universal, if I may, or the false universal, if I may, upon the multiple particulars should be critically reevaluated. But also the very structure of unity needs to be theoretically reconsidered. Uh, in this sense, uh, following Adorno in his excursus to Hegel, I subscribe that the view that a true preponderance of the particular would not be attainable except by changing the universal. In my view, this could be possible through the notion of concrete universal, namely the Hegelian unit of identity and difference and its reformulation and its reformulation by Theodor Adorno. This more or less um, summarizes also the, the observations that I, that, that I wrote together with Rebecca. Uh, I'm uh, nevertheless accentuating or underlining some, um, stressing some points here. Um, the third section is a very brief um, description or reconstruction of Massimiliano, Massimiliano Tomba's response. Um, in his response to our article, uh, Massimiliano Tomba indicates, um, and this is a very big quote, that the notion of universality emerges from the historical chapters of historical universality, not from a definition or a concept that he could have had included in the book's introduction. The theory he extracts from concrete social historical practice serves to challenge, and this is for me a key phrase, serves to challenge dominant concepts and categories in modern political discourse. The one world in my work, that one world um, that we discussed previously in the, the Zapatistas um, resolution, one world, where many worlds fit. So the one world in my work, um, a quote from Tomba, is constituted by the incompleteness of the experiment, also a fundamental statement. These experiments share something, an idea of universality, key element, which is unstable, fragile, and incomplete, end of quote. Taken into account uh, the, the, the importance of Tomba's response, I would now try as a final note 
to better understand Massimiliano Tomba's contribution to the debate on universality. And I would attempt to do so very briefly by focusing on the title, Insurgent Universality. Insurgency being the initial moment and universality the possible outcome. Insurgent as an event, as a practical social political event, would be the initial, the initial critique and universality, the possible outcome. These two elements are related and have an internal connection. Insurgency as a critical movement recognizes a false ideological universality. Insurgency also reveals a disciplinary synchronization through an abstract temporality and challenges its dominance. Insurgency would also unify calendars and geographies in the attempt of liberating itself from multiple oppressions and its categories, and at the same time, creating a possible reciprocal recognition between the plurality of temporalities. In this sense, maybe insurgency could be acquainted with the notion of contradiction, maybe a practical contradiction. The contradiction, like insurgencies, would then reveal what is missing in the so called notion of universality, what is missing in the given political categories of our time, and open the path for an unrealized for unrealized possibilities of transformation. For example, a, word, a world in which many worlds fit, always in a fragile, incomplete, and unstable way. That's it. Thanks a lot, Aldo. Alberto? Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, participate in this uh, discussion, a uh, discussion that follows uh, about three and a half years ago, when uh, I think we launched the book in person at, at a Historical Materialism Conference in London. So it was uh, also really interesting to return to the book uh, after the intervening passage. Um, and also uh, now um, speaking about the book from uh, a different uh, political and geographical vantage point, um, speaking from uh, unceded First Nation territories in uh, in uh, Vancouver, uh, territories of the Squamish, um, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations here in Burnaby, um, and you know from a situation in which many of the juridical, uh, political, and Temporal questions raised by uh, Massimiliano's book have a different resonance than they might have had for me in Bloomsbury in uh, 2019. So maybe we can uh, we can develop some of those ideas uh, as well. And one of the things that struck me in rereading uh, the book was um, really its capacity to um, not just to propose a whole set of conceptual, methodological, and, and critical perspectives to revitalize our you know, political thinking and action in this uh, period of uh, what Massimiliano in his initial comments called that of the you know, collapse of historical teleology and of the institutional and um, organizational uh, paraphernalia of dominant modernity. Um, but also uh, to, um, yeah, to, to really blast open the temporalities within which those uh, uh, frameworks take place. And so I was kind of, especially in the discussions of the theorizing, as Max rightly no, it's the theorizing that takes place, right? In 
in the declarations, decrees, and, and constitutional texts that he uh, discusses, um, there was something for me of the um, the effect uh, of uh, reading a, a wonderful um, fictional text, but I think a very political fictional text, which is a counterfactual communist science fiction novel from the 1980s uh, by Terry Bisson called Fire in the Mountain. Um, Fire in the Mountain is a, is, is a wonderful text that I highly recommend, at whose core is the um, uh, fictional premise uh, that the book is written from the perspective of a future world in which um, John Brown's uh, raid on Harper's Ferry uh, set off a successful slave uh, insurgency. And the book is written from the standpoint of a uh, uh, Black socialist republic uh, in a United States that's split in two, where the North is social democratic <laughs> and the South is uh, is uh, is uh, exists in kind of you know full communism, and the story of John Brown within the book is a nightmarish tale. So the story of our present, of what followed the John Brown raid, and of the uh, counter revolution of property against Black Reconstruction, that's the horror story that people in this other future. <laughs> tell their children, right? And the children are horrified by this book that circulates, which is basically a book retelling our history, right? As their nightmare. And reading some of Max's uh, 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 studies uh, in the historical chapters had somewhat of that, of that effect, right? Uh, both opening up the alternatives, but also I think stressing the nightmarish character <laughs> of uh, the paths that were taken, right? Rather than the ones that, that were not. Now, one of the things that, uh, again, in returning to the book, I thought seemed to me extremely significant um, was the way in which, especially in the texts that um, Massimiliano focuses on, you have something like a, um, a practical critique of the separations that dominate and, and oversee the, uh, the modernity that is here an uh, object of, of critique, right? Uh, above all, and I think this is very significant also in terms of um, Massimiliano's continued concern with uh, the political constitution and destitution of property, I think uh, I was, you know, particularly struck in, in returning to the book by the way in which um, whether it's uh, the Soviets uh, and the constituent assemblies and the decrees in 1918 or, or the Zapatista declarations, we have uh, ways of thinking the entanglement, the imbrication of the juridical, the political, and the social in ways which are um, not just extremely um, suggestive, but I think also uh, have their own urgency. And also, I think um, might push us to criticize what we could see as some pseudo alternatives, right, to, to modernity or at least some truncated or limited alternatives. Um, so for instance, uh, I think, especially in the chapter on the Russian Revolution and its impasses, um, Massimiliano provides a extremely powerful antidote to uh, the traducing of the uh, phenomenon of the Soviets in Hannah Arendt's On Revolution. Hannah Arendt's On Revolution, which depends on reinstating, albeit in a different key, those separations, right? By saying, you know, the problem with the Soviets was that they busied themselves with the social question. The kind of remarkably absurd critique, in my view. What else could they busy themselves with, right? But forms of life, social relations, relations of property, and uh, and so forth, right? Um, 
And I think then linking this practical critique of, uh, of the separations that, that govern uh, dominant modernity to uh, the question of temporality and anachronism is, uh, of course, um, uh, crucial to the book. I think it's also, and this might be among historical materialists, um, reason for, uh, for further debate uh, amongst ourselves and with the audience. Um, I think um, by focusing especially on the question of the relationship between property and possession, the Russian terms are not immediately available to me, but nevertheless, the distinctions that, that, that Max philologically extracts right from these texts, I think we also have a basis for what I think is an um, pleasantly unfamiliar uh, critique of Leninism. Right, so we're used to, you know, uh, in the kind of logical geography of the left or the far left, uh, we're used to a set of, you know, by now somewhat reflex moves, right? Anarchist critiques of Leninism and, and councilist critiques of Leninism and Menshevik or social democratic critiques of Leninism. But I think um, uh, Max's um, kind of inhabiting of these texts coming largely. You know, politically and ideologically, from the world of the you know left wing of the social revolutionaries, does bring out um, an area of uh, uh, of critique and debate that is uh, that is not really kind of dealt with, right? Because often the the critiques take place at a level which is, again, speaking of separations, purely political, right? At the level of uh, of just the centralization of power uh, or the question of violence questions of revolutionary expediency and so on and so forth. But I think articulating it in terms of the practices and theories of property um, in this uh, revolutionary phase makes for a much uh, richer discussion, right? About the impasses, the limits, the legacies um, of, um, of Lenin's practice. And then of course, use Leninism with, with some scare quotes, given that it's also just a, a doctrinal, retroactive, and Stalinist projection. But nevertheless, right? I think these are these are questions that that can open up uh, quite fruitful avenues of debate. Um, and I think, in this sense, I find, uh, though maybe in some ways complementary, Massimiliano's intervention more uh, fruitful or generative than the nevertheless very important and interesting work, for instance, um, of uh, Pierre Daudot and Christian Laval, right? Uh, around the relationship between political forms and property forms, which uh, I think in their case hinges far too much on a, on a kind of uh, 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 Proudhonian anarchism and on a somewhat um, uh, less uh, inventive uh, um, uh, repetition, right, of the uh, discussions between um, anarchist and, and and Marxist perspectives, right? So I think it's 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 uh, one of the virtues of Massimiliano's book that it doesn't sort of uh, repeat in a, in a new sauce the uh, split in the first international, but does something else. Um, so maybe I just wanted to uh, then finish off with some. Some open questions, right? That the the, the book uh, leaves me. One um, has to do with what is at stake in retaining the categories, notions, watchwords, right, of modernity and universality. And of course, in the book and in his interventions in the uh, historical materialism symposium, you know, Max does some quite nuance uh, answer to these. Um, but I do wonder uh, at times whether some of these trajectories stretch, right? These notions of universality and modernity, perhaps almost to a kind of breaking point. And I was also thinking, you know, uh, of um, histories, right? Of phenomena that some might include within either dominant or uh, alternative trajectories of modernity. Take the Haitian Revolution, 
uh, which do not necessarily um, easily fit uh, the parameters of really any kind of conception of universality or modernity that is maybe available to us. So I was thinking, for instance, of a really interesting book um, by, I think, a uh, former uh, uh, student of uh, James Scott's, uh, John Henry Gonzalez, uh, Maroon Nation. Um, uh, kind of alternative history, right, of the Haitian Revolution, a history of the Haitian Revolution really as a as, as a revolution that continues, right, after the constitutions, after after 1804, as a revolution against the anti and post colonial state, right, as a revolution against state formation of any kind. <laughs> But also a revolution that is entirely, uh, or at least a, a, a set of interlinked peasant-based insurgencies, right, and resistances uh, that doesn't necessarily have any particular interest in France, in the French Revolution, or indeed in linking up with other revolutionary movements elsewhere, right? Uh, and um, I, I was I was kind of struck about you know what, what, kind of like what we do, right? It's not really a separatism, right? But what we do about insurgencies that don't um, uh, think of themselves, right? Uh, and, and it's not enough to see them as universal from an external standpoint, right? If, if they don't, if they don't uh, necessarily practice uh, that universality. Uh, so that's one question, right? About, about the, the limits of the reinvention of, of modernity and, uh, or, or, or the, the, the question of an alternative modernity or universality. And I guess the last uh, point, that I think is very interesting to think through, and I also think about this as a you know really um, live uh, political and, and juridical issue, including in context of of, of struggles uh, for actual rather than merely ideological decolonization in the present, um, is a question of what the material. Uh, and in a sense, the political economic conditions for the pluralisms that Massimiliano is exploring, right, in, in the text. And I, I was thinking, for instance, of the way in which the pluralism enacted, right, uh, in the some of the documents that coming out of the left social revolutionaries in 1918 depend on the existence, right, of of uh, forms of life, of professional categories, of labor organizations that are distinct and therefore right have a possibility of formulating their own uh, autonomies right you know what happens to these frameworks uh in situations where there aren't right such living such forms of life right to to uh, rely on that's of course not uh or at least not uh, not not entirely the situation in in indigenous struggles, but certainly if you think of what juridical pluralism might mean for uh, downwardly mobile lower middle classes in you know European metropolis, it's not entirely clear to me that there are any forms of life to build autonomy on, right? At least not in the sense that we would have found in 1918 in Russia, right? And and, and therefore. I wonder how much, um, I wonder what the conditions of translatability, right, are between juridical pluralisms that have land, not just as a category, but like as an experience, right, as a, as, and as a form, and as a relation to domains in which that is not, right, the, the, the primary kind of like basis material or, or lived for, for, for politics. Um, so I find the proposal very, um, suggestive, uh, even attractive, but I, I do wonder, right, about, uh, uh, for instance, the, the translatability, you know, and that's something that was experienced in a, in a kind of sense as a, as, a, as a failure of translation of cognitive mapping, right, uh, throughout the so-called alter globalization movement of the 90s, extremely inspired by Zapatismo, but it's not clear to me that it was able to draw any, <laughs> you know, practical juridical political <laughs> lessons right from that model it was very inspiring but i'm not sure you know it was it was translated into the conditions of uh of the uh, uh metropolis in so-called advanced liberal capitalist domains in ways that 
had any uh, real vitality. So I, I kind of wonder about that. Uh, in any case, it, it's been uh, a real, um, uh, yeah, real pleasure to kind of return to these discussions. And I think they also, um, yeah, uh, as I sort of suggested by mentioning the work of Dardot and Laval, but I could mention tons of other uh, different perspectives. I think uh, Massimiliano's book is also part of uh, a broader, if not necessarily convergent set of efforts to link uh, uh, juridical, temporal, and political questions, especially around rethinkings of property, of thinking uh, of, of of the work of Robert Nichols or Brenna Bandar and others, that I think is is uh, yeah really um, uh, really a kind of vital area, right, for for discussion. So I'd also be interested to to hear from from Max how he sees his own work, right, in terms of these ongoing uh, dialogues and debates. Thanks a lot, Alberto. And uh, I'll take the opportunity to remind our audience that uh, they can put questions in the YouTube chat function, and we will re relay them to the uh, to our presenters. So far, we do not have uh, any uh, questions. So uh, I take the opportunity and use a little bit of chair privilege. Uh, just to uh, share a couple, one or two thoughts. Well, I, I, my main, what I really think important about uh, Massimiliano's book uh, is something that he mentioned today when he said that treating the insurgents as theorists, which I believe is very different than treating the insurgents as moralists. That is, uh, what Marx does is he goes beyond what we might say a form of Kantianism from below. The idea that you can find, because the idea that you can find uh, normative aspects in, 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 you know, subaltern struggles, or you can find, uh, is something that you can also treat it in other uh, relations, not other traditions, not necessarily uh, historical materialist uh, in the broad sense. And I think what is important is exactly that it's not just about, because the danger in that case, the case of a, of a Kantianism uh, from, uh, from below is uh, that it, it goes into the vicious circle of always treating, you know, instead this has already constructed as, you know, Kantian subjects, whatever this would mean. Whereas I believe that uh, you, you offer a much more uh, uh, fruitful, in a certain way, uh, description of the kind of, of dynamics that emerge through uh, subaltern struggles and the potential they entail, the, the potential they entail in the production of social forms, uh, new ways of thinking, and new forms of, you know, new forms of institutions. I think this is very important. And I think. This is also very pertinent in, in contemporary uh, debates, because if you look, uh, and, and, and it is, it's a very good coincidence that, you know, we're discussing this at a time where we're, you know, looking with expectation, for example, what is going to happen in France, when you see the kind of, you know, return of really mass uh, movements and, you know, forms that might, might even get a kind of insurrection or a dynamic. And I think it's it's your your book is very useful as a reminder that uh, a, a po any any possible politics of emancipation is exactly about treating the insurgents as theories, treating whatever is happening within uh, movements and these dynamics as as the laboratory of political forms, which is something very different to the approach from let's say most of left-wing tendencies, which whether they acknowledge it of, or not, basically are, uh, I might use this word, and I use it in a pejorative way, left populists, that is, they have a kind of politics from above, that politics in, in the end is always about a discourse that someone is going to hear and then follow instead, let's say, a politics of listening and uh, learning of what, you know, actual people are doing in their actual struggles. And I believe that your book contributes to that, also adding in a non-historicist way, uh, the importance of temporalities. 
I mean, which, which I think is also very, very, very important. I mean, for, for someone like me coming for a very, supposedly very strongly anti-historicist tradition as a good Algerian, uh, the question of, of history is always, you know, a, a lacuna, it's always a very open question because history is something that is there, is there in, in, in memories, is there in monuments, is there in material traces, uh, is there in, in, in narratives that continue to, uh, to be repeated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yeah, finding a way to bring back uh, historicity and temporality in, 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 in all their discordance I think it's very, very, uh, very important. And, and I think to, to that end, your book is also a very important uh, uh, contribution uh, to that end. Anyway, uh, that was just my my comment. Yes, and if you want to respond. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for all your comments and questions. It's a lot. Uh, I think I need more time. Let me see what I can do in a few minutes. Uh, uh, that is not the time of my answer. It's the time I need to think. I am a very slow thinker. So <clears throat> let me try to put it this way. Uh, um, and I want to start from the end. So yes, as the Panagiotis has said, you know, it's a, treating the insurgents as a theorist. That was a, one of my guidelines. And it is one of my guidelines in the book, and uh, and the sense of uh, you know treating them as a theorist theorist goes really deep uh, in a, in a way that uh, you know when Aldo correctly listed a few names Kozelek, Bloch, Marx, and Benjamin, uh, I would uh, add. Yes, and then the insurgents as a part of the, you know, the same kind of uh, constellation in which the concept of stay of the con the term, I don't know, the term of time and history can be reconsidered, but in their own practice. So basically what I'm saying is, uh, you know, if we want to try to use a more sophisticated language. I think what uh, what Kozelek, in my opinion, missed is that uh, time, time can be temporalized in different ways, in many different ways. For Kozelek, uh, only, only modernity temporalized time. And for that reason, pre-modern experience uh, do not have the sense of uh, anachronism. So only the modern can distinguish between what is a synchrony and what is an out of sync and the anachrony. Now the point is uh, that uh, this is this is uh, this is uh, this is correct but only for the modern concept of uh, time and this uh, this is correct only for uh, the way modernity temporalizes time and basically from the perspective of the future. Uh, but when we when we when we pay attention to these other theorists, the, the insurgents, then something else something else happens, and uh, and uh, we can see that uh, you know I need uh, again historical concrete examples to, to make theory. So, for example, the the communards in 1871 they restore and the language restoration was very present uh, in the Paris Commune as it was uh, in other big insurgencies. Uh, they restored the imperative mandate from Middle Ages. They and, they, it, and this is written in, the, in, in some of their documents they restored the communal freedom liberties again from Middle Ages and so on. So the point is they were not afraid of uh, two things. They were not afraid of restoring anachronisms in the present in a way that these uh, anachronistic institutions, from the point of view of the dominant temporality, 
they were anachronistic. This is what the French Revolution slipped away. But uh, they, 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 they tried to restore some of these institutions. So they were not afraid of the anachronistic character of these institutions on the one hand. And uh, on the other hand, they were not afraid by doing that to make an explicit reference to Middle Ages. That again, from the point of view of the dominant modernity, the Middle Ages is just the dark age, is, is, is everything that is opposed to freedom, equality, civilization, modern, everything is, 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 is negative, has been defined as a, something that belongs to Middle Ages. In one word, modernity invented and had to invent the Middle Ages as a polemical concept. Now, in the practice of these, uh, of the communards, Middle Ages was, uh, was just an arsenal of uh, possibilities. This is the, 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 the Blockian intuitions. The past is uh, full of uh, possibilities, is uh, full of uh, futures. And the point is how to reanimate these uh, futures, how to reactivate these uh, futures in the present so that they can lead to a different configuration of the present and therefore of the future. So what is uh, interesting again is, uh, is, uh, is that uh, to think about temporalization of time and the uh, practices of, uh, of history and making history, I think uh, we need to put in conversation all the thinkers, I agree with you, although they are fundamental in my, in my training, in my education, in the way I think. But we have to put these thinkers in conversation with the, with the other thinkers, the, the other theorists, the insurgents. And, uh, and, and, and I think, is this something sooner or later I wanna, I wanna bribe? I think that this is the starting point of a real alternative canon. An alternative canon is not a canon, philosophical, theoretical, canon of political theory, a canon of Western canon, whatever you want to call it. it. An alternative canon is not a canon that includes some of the thinkers who were excluded from the canon. By including these people, you make it just the canon a little bit larger and you don't undermine the very logic of the canon. The canon can be expanded. You can add a chapter and you can have a thinkers who were excluded the past. That doesn't change anything in my opinion. What, what can change the logic of the canon is a, is a dissertation between what we consider the canonical thinkers and the, and the, and the and the insurgents, the activists, as a theory. So when we start putting together theory and, and practice, and practice as a theory in action, that I think can lead to a different understanding of the canon. So <clears throat> it's, 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 if, if you want an example, it's, it's, you know, it's like, a, yes, we can, we can write uh, about John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, but uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I am so original that I am the first one who thinks such a thing, but we have to write about the John Locke and we hold the John Locke on the, on, uh, on, the, on the left hand. And at the same time, we have to read all the documents and the declarations of the diggers and try to understand the Locke as an attempt to, 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 to or, or, or as, a, as a kind of, a, as a weapon against, that other possible trajectory, the trajectory of the diggers and common possessions and, and self-government, that because that was a possible outcome of the English revolution that has to be crushed. And I think is, is if, you, if you, we start doing, the, doing this kind of things, we can see how basically both are using the same passages from the Bible and the gospels, but that they read the same passages in the opposite way. So, I think there is a lot of work that has to be done in, in what an alternative canon looks like. And, 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 and I think I would say, you know, my humble contribution 
to an alternative canon is uh, try to put in conversation all these uh, insurgents and, and how they think not only about some institutions that is extremely important, but how they practice time differently when they use terms like a restoration instead of revolution and how their use of restoration helps us to rethink the meaning of revolution today and the, and the, and, and the trajectory of the, of the concept of revolution, especially after the French Revolution, that, that, that became basically the revolution through which the state shapes society. But at a certain point, you have a society that pushes back and, and, and society tries to restore a different, a different configuration, a different uh, framework of institution. So this is the kind of the history I'm interested to do. And that requires a lot of theory. <clears throat> and I think it can be said, and I say it already for, for sovereignty and how you know, the, again, the practice of this, uh, democratic excess, the practice of a pluralism of the many assemblies and Soviets can help us to rethink a, a, a legal framework in which sovereignty is dispersed. But that means again, that, you know, that means that we have to work with a political framework that is more unstable and in which, and maybe I'm going in, in in the direction of a, of a, of what you said about the pluralism that uh, I try to answer from a different angle. So this this is a pluralism that is also you know is not only a pluralism of uh, of events and the pluralism of uh, historical trajectories, but in this case can also be a pluralism of uh, assemblies and authorities. So now now the point is that. Uh, does this uh, pluralism go into the direction of uh, relativism? Uh, my answer, I think we agree more than what we think, or, or maybe we know that we agree, because, because I think we, we use different, a different language and different terminology. Uh, uh, I, I suppose I abandon some of these, uh, Again, terminology like a contradiction because it, because it, maybe just because it belongs to my youth. I I I I wrote on Hegel. I wrote a book on Bauer. I wrote articles on Hegel again, and then and then I try to move on. And 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 basically, I try to do with the history of philosophy what I I'm doing now with the history. I try to I try to understand okay what the history of philosophy looks like if we work with a different kind of a, 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 a line, a trajectory that goes from Kant to Fichte to the Romantic, Schlegel, and, and, and you, can, um, you can see that uh, I want to end with the Benjamin. And, 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 and we have a, basically this other trajectory that is, can skip Hegel. And then, it, it, you know, and, and you, have a, you have a theory and philosophy that works with a, with a, with a different theoretical arsenal. Uh, I think I think history of philosophy can also the history of philosophy can also be rewritten in a way that uh, you we 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 can see branches instead of uh, uh, the, the the big unilinear course of uh, of history that is in a certain way very Hegelian. This is uh, this is how Hegel thought as history of philosophy. At a certain point comes. Fichte that uh, solves uh, some of the contradiction of Kant, and then Hegel solves the contradiction of Fichte. And said, no, maybe not. Maybe Fichte was going in a different direction, and 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 the Romantic got it, and and so on. So I think uh, I think uh, so. Now, what about uh, about pluralism and, and and relativism? That is, a, I think, is a, is an interesting question. So I think uh, we agree on one thing. Obviously, we agree that uh, universality cannot be defined in terms of uh, opposition to a common enemy. 
this is a, 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 a very, very, very weak form of communality. It's extremely fragile. So then, then we need to understand a different way. So what is a universal in what I call universality? Uh, I think I think I think you are correct in this when when you cite the Zapatistas again they are our theorists so one world in which many worlds fit and 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 then I would say the difference between what we are saying and the, let me put it in this way now I'm polemical but and the decolonial discourse is that the decolonial discourse emphasizes the many worlds and the plurality. And in a certain way, they even forget that there is a one world in which all these many worlds fit. What we want to say is, no, be careful, there is a one world. Now, now, our problem, our, our task, our theoretical and political task is how can we define this one world? And then, you know, I can, I think, I think at, at this point, I think there is a work that has to be done. And, uh, but at this point, I can only repeat what you just said by, I think you were citing me. I think for me, this one word is the, is the incompleteness of the project. It's still that. So what does it mean that the project is incomplete? Uh, if, I, if, I, if I take back one term from, from Bloch and, and Bloch on this uh, essay on, on, on differentiation on the concept, uh, in the concept of future, uh, it, it block and and that is a say with this idea of the the human the humanum. Now, what we can say is that we don't know what the hell is the human. We don't know what the humanum looks like. This is, if you want, this is the the, the Kantianism in the in the in the best way. But this is the Kantianism of block. Hmm? So this is a kind of a human that transcends specific forms of uh, humans. It's, a, it's still a kind of idea, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that we need to realize, but we don't, we don't know how. So this is the openness of the project. What, but this, this, the openness of the project gives us something more than that, gives us a, some guidelines and gives us a very specific and important political guideline. So that basically what is not acceptable in this pluralism is an experiment that is based or grounded on the exclusion of other experiments because that experiment doesn't accept itself as incomplete. I would call this a latter form of experiment a fascist experiment. The fascist experiment excludes other experiment. The fascist experiment defines itself as uh, the truth, as a complete, and uh, and uh, and uh, and basically deny the incompleteness of itself. So this is these kind of experiments are unacceptable in the idea of uh, incompleteness and openness of the experiment. Otherwise, I think, yes, there are different ways we can manage with, uh, with these uh, pluralities of, uh, of uh, powers, institutions, authorities. Uh, and as I say, tension and conflict can emerge. So I'm not dreaming, uh, or yes, I'm dreaming, but I know that is a dream, at least uh, so far, uh, the dream of a, of a, of a, of a, of a future, future, future peaceful society in which there will be no conflict. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I, probably we will manage with the conflict for hundreds or thousands of years. I, 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 don't, I don't know that. Uh, I, what I know is that uh, I, I, I want to consider conflict as uh, a dimension of politics. So better to learn how to deal with conflict than to try to neutralize conflict. 
because the, we know the trajectory that the try to neutralize conflict. This is the trajectory of the modern state. And the price we paid and we are still paying for that trajectory is pretty high. And, and I think it's enough. I, I don't wanna pay that price anymore. So, and, and that allows me to go to the last point against something that I can learn from insurgents, the insurgents, and, and this, is, this is about the property. There's something that uh, Alberto pointed out, the differentiation between property and possession. And, and, and what, I, I, what I learned from, from the insurgent, but now is a different example, and, and, and this is a case in my, in my new book, in the work of anachrony, uh, is a, something that emerged, and not only there, but something that emerged in the 2000 water war in Cochabamba, in Bolivia. So when there was an attempt to privatize the water, the insurgents were against the privatization, but they were also against the nationalization of water. So what I thought was interesting there was that this is a kind of a attempt to break the binary privatization, nationalization of water. What they did was uh, to restore slash reinvent indigenous traditions, forms of uh, customs, traditions, reciprocal obligations. And, uh, and, and this reconfiguration of the past and present gave rise to, gave rise to something else that they called social property. Now, what is interesting about social property, and I want to stop here, is, uh, is that a social property is not a right And, and, and we can start this, you know, seeing a different grammar that is uh, no longer the Western legal grammar. So social property is not a right. Social property is a practice, but it is a practice that gives priority to obligations over rights. And I think this is also very interesting because when you have obligations, you have a reciprocal obligation among users and then you have a limit, and then you have a, the possible democratization of the use of common resources. So in a certain way, what you get is that a, a radical democratization of the use of uh, common resources redefine the grammar of property in a way that the binary national private is broken. And I think this is, this, is, this, is, this is, for me, crucial. This is what I can learn from practices, from the insurgents. And, and I think for me, it's more val valuable than 15, 20 books on, 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 the concept of, of a, on the concept of a property. Because this is, this is, this is the, the, the alternative theory in action. It failed, yeah, more or less, but it, 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 still, it, it still exists in some part of the of Cochabamba in neighborhoods and so on. And not only there. Uh, I think I think uh, I think at this point, you know, my, uh, how I let me put it in this way. How do I think about what I'm doing? I don't think I can provide a, a solution for, uh, for, uh, for, 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 the, for the kitchen of, uh, of, uh, of the future. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I, think um, I can only try to provide categories and concepts that uh, I extract from, from these uh, practices. And then when we have a different language, maybe we can start thinking differently. And if we start thinking differently, we can give rise to different practices. So in a certain way, I, I find, I, I think of myself in a kind of a very humble position uh, in which I, I can only learn from these insurgents how to rethink about my own work and, 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 and theory.
I know there is more than that in in your comments, but uh, I I think there are also there are also some questions from from YouTube. So I I, I should stop here, but I'm happy to continue the conversation. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Max. Well, so far we have one question from the audience. Uh, you can read it in our chat and I will also read it. It's a question from John Barry. And the question is, what does the panel think about right-wing populism having a more effective political strategy than socialists at this current historical moment in their embracing of insurgent disruption? This is the question we have. And I also urge the audience to, you know, post more questions. Uh, now, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a question for the entire panel, and I guess also Aldo or Alberto want to, you know, again, uh, respond to both this question and uh, also uh, uh, Massimiliano's response. So I suggest Aldo or Alberto, you go first. You want to comment in any? Uh, sure, why not? Um... Well, insurgent disruption on the populist or far right. There's a way in which uh, I'm kind of reminded of that um, formulation in uh, Eric Fromm's uh, 1940s book, right? Escape from Freedom, you know, where the, the figure that the psychosocial type of of the far right is the authoritarian rebel, and uh, I think a lot of these uh, insurgent disruptions take that form, right? They they um, perform uh, a sort of uh, enjoyment and a practice of uh, of rebellion, but always with the the premise um, and the desire, right, for another better, more stable order. So we can definitely see them as insurgencies, and indeed, on the on the fringes, of course, we find much. Uh, you know, we find forms of uh, right wing mobilization, often with very disturbing um racist overtones but which nevertheless is kind of you know genuinely uh anti-statist or genuinely um against uh, the uh the established forces of order but i still think takes that form of authoritarian rebellion now one thing that i think would be uh interesting to um to note, maybe vis-a-vis -vis Massimiliano's arguments, I'll just take the opportunity of this question maybe to, to delve into it further, is that, is that of course, there are um, trends in right-wing thought which see themselves as affirming uh, pluralism, uh, affirming the, the plurality of of uh, concrete uh, orders in, in one sense, and, and also see themselves as affirming uh, critique, right, of uh, homogenizing dominant model of the state, including of the modern nation state, right? So there's a, you know, if you think of um, a lot of what came and comes out of the Nouvelle Droite in France, right, um, was was explicitly um, articulated around what it saw as the as the restrictive, uh, disastrous forms of modernity that linked, uh, you know, global capitalism to the modern nation state, right, and uh, and instead posed a pluralism of uh, small nations or indeed even tribes with nebulously defined you know ethnic identities and the like so i think it's it's not insignificant that that there are these uh imaginaries of 
pluralism and imaginaries of anti-statism and imaginaries of alternative modernity on the right. I don't think they're by any means dominant. I'm not entirely sure they're even that significant to the dynamics of uh, powerful forces on the right, not least because they go against uh, many of the imperatives of capitalist reproduction if they're taken really seriously. <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, still it's it's an interesting thing to keep in mind, right? And I was also, you know, it's also interesting if one thinks of even the uh, juridical thinking of uh, the European far right, indeed, the juridical thinking under national socialism. Has anybody ever been more against Roman law than Nazis? Probably not. Uh, Schmidt himself was, you know, had to retract his own... Uh, uh, you know, faithfulness to aspects of Roman law in order to, you know, kind of get with the program. So, you know, of course, you know, and and there was all sorts of speculation by Nazi jurists about German freedoms, about conceptions of possessions that were not property, right? So there is a, you know, it's these things don't just take place like on our side, right? This is not to say that this should make us worried and contaminates thinkings of alternative, alternatives to modernity, but I still think it's yeah, it's worth um, soberly uh, thinking through, right? Um, especially around the question of pluralism, I think, more than necessarily around the question of um, of insurgency per se. Um, yes, uh, Aldo, you want to uh, say something or? Yes, Max, you want one minute? Yes, you can have it. Okay, I can. I can jump in. Uh, Aldo, you want to go first? Yes, yes, you go first. I can go first. Uh, uh, very quickly, mm -hmm. I completely. I mean, I'm. I. I think that, as you said, uh, Massimiliano, we agree. Um, we agree. Of course, on the fundamental issues, but also beyond that, I think that we share the concern of debating universality. And as you put it, with uh, the very the Zapatista statement, some some um, let's say some voices within post-colonial um, theory would underline the um, multiplicity or the multiple worlds, and some of us are. Still considering that, but uh, asking ourselves once again about the question of a possible uh, universality, the one world in which this plurality could take place. I think that's that's a crucial statement. Another one is, and I think this is it's it's very good to hear it from you. It gives another light to your book. Um, you framed it in the following way: practice as theory in action. So you're not only putting. Uh, the Zapatistas or the Comunards uh, together with Benjamin and Marx and uh, Koselek and Bloch, but you're also conceiving them as authors themselves, themselves, and even beyond as the privileged, privileged authors of our specific time. So, because if, if I read you, if I understand it correctly, you say, well, we, we still have the theoretical arsenal available to us. We have the different traditions within European thought, within also, uh, let's say, uh, non-continental understanding, philosophy, historical uh, history of philosophy. We have those categories and we can reach into them in order to rethink alternatives. But in this period of time, the real authors are um, those movements that you called practice as theory in action. But th then, um, I mean, these are all very, very complex ideas. Um, I mean, you could also say it if you, if you read into an Adornian understanding of Hegel, not, to, let's say, not the classical reading of Hegel, but if you look, read into the Adornian under, of, uh, uh, understanding of Hegel, you could also ask yourself, or I ask myself, if you're not putting a different, you're putting in a different, somehow putting in a different perspective, the, these, the old idea of the realization of the concept of humanity in history, but from below, 
just to extend a little bit uh, to, uh, the metaphor. You're not focusing on the big narrative that was sold to us based on the European tradition, etc. So looking into the realization of the human project from below in a very Benjaminian, uh, um, I would say, spirit. Um, and then the question, and this is also, once again, I think a very complicated question to answer now, but uh, practice as theory in action, certain social events, certain, certain insurgents. But the question is, and probably this relates to the question that was asked um, previously, not every insurgency should be or could be considered practice in action. And you more or less signaled certain criteria to answer this question. Um, when, we were talk, when you were talking about the experiments, and I want to ask you about this, I want to ask you if you've thought a little bit more about these, um, the way to understand the experiment, that you mentioned that the experiment of the realization of the concept of humanity from below, if I may, if I may put it like that, this experiment um, has like a normative element, which would be the exclusion of other experiments. And then you reached out to the Italian tradition. So fascism, Italian fascism, as an experiment that understood itself as a closed experiment, as a finished experiment. It did not conceive itself, and we agree in that, as an unfinished project. It was already a finished project that just needed to be implemented, and that itself was not compatible with other coexistent projects. Uh, so then the question would be probably not everyone, not every insurgency is or has the possibility of creating a new universality. And probably those who are not in, those who are not able to recreate a universal flame are those who in principle cannot recognize the otherness in a symmetrical way. So with the, without this reciprocal, reciprocal recognition, the, you're not, the experiment would not work, to put it bluntly somehow. But this is also, this is only a big question. And uh, I would just, I would like to refer to, to the question about uh, the right. And I think that we could also work an answer with Massimiliano's um, ideas in the sense, I would just very, very provisionally claim that the right doesn't have in this moment, in, in this historical period, doesn't have a problem um, with relating to its past. So the right is actually working with its past in a very free and motivated uh, way. And the left, if there's the, the many, um, the many expressions of the of the left, uh, in the global south, the global north, and Latin America and Europe, um, is still struggling with its relation between the past and the future. Uh, I believe that the that the. The, the left is still still struggling with the answer for the future, but has somehow, as Massimiliano stated, broken the dialectic between past and future, and once again accepted the closure of the past. It, it's a very abstract um, hint, but I think that probably we can read, let's say, the um, the strength or the some kind of strength that the right has obtained in this uh, period of time, probably mainly in Europe, if I see the Italian case, the French case, um, the German case, the Spanish case, um, probably because the way through which they're working with the resources provided to them from their own understanding of the past and the way they're actualizing those resources in order to create a viable regressive notion of future and the left still struggling with that that would be my point thanks thanks a lot aldo we have uh, two questions uh, before i give uh, the floor again to max 
uh, so that uh, Max can include also these questions. And you can also, uh, so the first question is from Owen Holland, and it is, with reference to the commune of 1851, if one thinks in terms of restoration rather than revolution, is there not some possibility that the key mobilizing agency or effect will be nostalgia? Notwithstanding Michael's, Mike, uh, Michel Levy's work on romanticism, nostalgia won't necessarily allow for a productive politics, make America great again, etc. But I take it that Massimiliano is envisaging a more productive mobilization of nostalgia. Might he want to comment on this? This is the first question from Comrade Owen Holland. And the second question is from Samuel O'Connor, Perks. And it is, is Bloch more important for understanding the Diggers legacy than historians such as Christopher Hill? What does a non-synchronous reading of class struggle, struggle so that Hill's Marxist history does not? So these are two questions that uh, Max can you know, also include uh, in his uh, response and also response to what uh, Aldo and Alberto have said. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, wanna start with the, with the, the right wing uh, populism. Uh, very short comment. Uh, I would say that one thing uh, I'm I'm doing, I want, or I'm trying to do in 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 the Surgeon Universality and even more in my new book is a <clears throat> is a is a form of a reappropriation of uh, what is ours, if you want. So what I mean is a uh, terms like. Uh, tradition, past, religion, authority, community, obligations, and others. This, as a block would have say, these are terms that belong to our tradition, but the left has left all these terms, and the right has stolen, and, uh, and they have uh, appropriated these terms, and they are using the past, they are mon monopolizing the past. And I think this is a part of, uh, this is part of the problem. And uh, I think, uh, you know, Aldo, Aldo said something in the similar direction. Oh, another term is, uh, is a pluralism, as Alberto said. Pluralism belongs, uh, belongs uh, to our tradition or one of uh, our traditions. And, uh, and I had a conversation, I think one year ago, or two years ago, I don't remember with the, uh, with a kind of a left uh, left liberal here in California, because in California there was a <clears throat> there was a recall <clears throat> that is this uh, right to call back one of your representatives, <clears throat> and this uh, left liberal was uh, totally against uh, recall that he defined as a as a right wing Republican institution, and I said really, I I saw recall. In the in the Paris Commune, in the in the in the in the German Council's Republic, uh, in the Russian Revolution, I think it's something that belongs to us. The problem is that uh, we forgot that uh, this institution is a part of uh, our tradition, and now we attack recall as a something that belongs to the Republican and the right wings. So I think I think we. We, we cannot move one inch from where we are if we still work with the with the, with the this opposition that is a, even a kind of internal opposition. We are playing concepts like a state, a secularism, progress, society against community in a way that basically we are giving to the right so many weapons to mobilize people. Because some of these terms, as a block would have said again, they belong, they belong to the, the more emotional, active tradition of Marxism. 
we don't convince people with the cold analysis uh, of the crisis. We need uh, to find a, a way to talk to what is uh, immediate to people's needs. I think it's a kind of, you know, trying to go back to, 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 to history 101. And, 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 and again, and I think it can happen by, by, by reappropriating what is ours. And that allows me to say one thing about the restoration and nostalgia. Exactly, they are not the same, they are the same thing. I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> in a certain way, <clears throat> nost oh, we can, again, we can discuss about the semantic of the term, nostalgia or romanticism, but restoration doesn't mean to go back because that assumes, it still assumes a unilinear historical time. And then you go back and you restore something and you move on. No, if, if, if we understand a multiverse of, uh, of historical times, you don't go back. You just uh, jump into a different layer, a different historical layer. And you, and you extract from, different, from this different layer material that you need to reconfigure the present is not nostalgia. Can be, can be, you know, a different, obviously is also a different narrative of, uh, of, uh, of history. And, uh, and, and this is what happens uh, uh, with the diggers, for example, when they refer to, to, the, to the Norman York, but in a, in a way that is a completely different from the dominant uh, British narrative. The, uh, uh, for them, the Norman York, or what, what precedes the Norman York, was not better than what came after, because it was uh, still affected by property and domination. So, and their, 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 their way to restore the past for the diggers was uh, just to go back to, to, to what we can find in the Bible. Is abstract. Yes and no, because that was the emotional language of uh, the people and the peasants. So it, 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 the difficulty is to work with all these different uh, uh, um, languages and grammars simultaneously at the same time. And, uh, and yes, I agree that in a certain way, Reading the diggers with the block can be more productive than rereading the diggers with uh, Christopher Hill, because of what you get with the block. Now I become a little bit uh, 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 more 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 philosopher. But what you get with the block is uh, is uh, is the distinction that he made in in his book on Thomas Münzer, a book that has to be translated into English as soon as possible, in my opinion. Uh, uh, in his book on Münzer, Bloch made this distinction between two forms of a memory or, or a rememoration. So Erinnerung that belongs to the kind of a Hegelian tradition and Eingedenken, that is the term that uh, Walter Benjamin will use. So an Eingedenken is, uh, is about the openness of the past. So if uh, we are reading Thomas Münzer today and the German peasants war today that happened in 1525 is because of that possibility is still open because of that, that trajectory was a crashed but is still open. And the point is that was a crashed as an episode of, a, I don't know how to call it, of internal colonialism was a crashed in order for Europe to impose what we call Eurocentrism or the, or, or the dominant trajectory of Western modernity, but was only one. So if we still talk about Europe as a monolithic thing that is dominant and colonial, basically we kill the peasants in 1525 once again. We kill the communards once again, because these people were trying to go in a different direction. They, they showed us alternatives. And the dominant trajectory of Europe, of a Western, the Western dominant trajectory, defined itself through those massacres, in, in, in the conflict with those massacres. And this is 
maybe a kind of a, not an answer, but a, just a, 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 a first step for a, for a, for a, for a conversation with, a, with Aldo. I would say maybe it's not about uh, rewriting the history from below against the history from above, the dominant history. I think it's a more about uh, how can we work in the tension between these uh, two dimensions, from below and from uh, above? Because, uh, because I think it's the tension that modifies both. And 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 what I you know what I was saying before about an alternative canon and what makes an alternative canon very difficult is basically because the focus of the alternative canon should be the tension between these two dimensions, in which both elements are modified at the same time. So even the domin so when Luther crushed Münzer, Protestantism. Reformation became something else because of that conflict, and and I think we 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 should start thinking in, in, in this way. I think there is more, but I, uh, I maybe there are more questions. <clears throat> okay, well. Uh... Yeah, we have we have we have another question. If you want to say, but very uh, a short answer, Max. Uh, the, the question is from Leonel Diogo, and the question is, uh, how should we consider online movements? Whether this uh, virtual aspect affects our thinking? <clears throat> my <clears throat> my my honest answer is a. Uh, I don't know, but what I know is what I, I learned from, from the right. There is a documentary uh, on, on Steve Bannon, uh, American Dharma by Errol. At a certain point in this documentary, I, I, I really recommend to watch this uh, documentary. At a certain, a certain point, Steve Bannon tells a story and this is the story of Dave. <clears throat> Dave, in the real life, is, a, is what Steve Bannon called a loser. A guy that lives with a, his mother. Uh, he, he has a family, but uh, his, the family is totally neglected. He doesn't care about the family. He sits on his couch, he eats junk food all the time, and he plays video game all the time. And there is a hero. So the point is, and he has a, I don't remember the name. Uh, he has a different name in the video game, obviously. And in the video game, this Dave is uh, the man, is the hero. Is a, <clears throat> a multiplayer video game. Okay. At a certain point, Dave passed away. When the players knew about that uh, their hero is dead, they organized a funeral in the video game. Hundreds or thousands of uh, players were at the funeral. But because there is another faction, the opposite faction took the opportunity to attack the friends of uh, Day. A war began online in the video game. Okay. Now Steve Bannon say, maybe the story is a fake, I don't know. But then Steve, Steve Bannon say, that day, hundreds of people didn't go to school. They didn't go to work. They were playing to defend their hero in the video game. So the video game, what they were doing there, there was affecting what we call the real world, the real reality. But Steve Bannon said, asked, so and now what is real? Is it more real the life that Dave had in the video game in which he was able to mobilize thousands of people or the life of Dave that he spent sitting on the couch 
and eating junk, junk food. So what I would say is not an answer, but what I would say is that uh, I think the right wing has a learn or, or is a learning how to weaponize virtual reality in a way that the left doesn't do. But I'm not sure about that. I just, uh, I, 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 uh, I, when I, when I heard that this, uh, this uh, description by Steve Bannon, obviously as, as, as everybody else, I, I made an immediate link between what he said, and that was before January 6th, and then the insurrection of January 6th. So how, you, what you can create in this virtual reality can affect at least a few people, some people, the, the, what we call the real world. And then again, the question is what is real? How many level of realities? But I, I have a questions about that. I don't have a, I don't have a real answer. I, I think uh, better for us to learn how to deal with the online politics and online movement as soon as possible. And, and without being dismissive, I, I'm not dismissive, I, I don't buy, but I, I'm not dismissive of, of a conspiracy theories. There is a something there. There is a, there is a gigantic dissatisfaction with the dominant narrative, but they go in a crazy direction. But, but, but the point is who is able to to use, to orient this a huge amount of dissatisfaction. For sure, not the left. And I think this is a problem. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Max. I think we can uh, wrap it up uh, now, unless Aldo or Alberto want to add something. Okay, well, if they do not, yes, Alberto. No. Okay. Okay, in that case, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, our panel, beginning with uh, Massimiliano Tomba, Aldo Beretta, and Alberto uh, Toscano. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all of you who uh, watched us live tonight.